Um, okay. So chapter 25 is growth and development of the newborn and infant from one to 12 months is what we're specifically talking about here. Um, so there's a few different things that we want to look at. So first we have physical, like what should we be looking at in terms of their growth um, physically, such as weight, length, head circumference. Those are really, really important. So when we're talking about weight, the birth weight should double by the time they turn six months of age and the birth weight should triple by one year of age. So if this was a five pound baby, they should be 10 pounds at six months and then they should be 15 pounds at one year of age. In terms of length, they should grow in length by one inch per month for the first six months. For head circumference, the size of the head, there's going to be a lot of changes that are going to happen, especially with the posterior and anterior fontanelle. But the posterior fontanelle is going to close between um, months one to three. And um, you can correct me if I'm wrong. It's definitely going to be somewhere in here, but I believe the anterior um, fontanelle closes somewhere um, around 18 months. Um, I have to find it somewhere in the notes but regardless that's why they say especially as a newborn right you can't really touch the head or put too much pressure on a baby's head because they still don't have those fontanelles closed yet so we could do damage to the baby's skull they also have um development in terms of like I guess we can call this emotionally or they're psychosocial. Now, we know babies can't talk and tell us things, so I'm not talking about that. But according according to Erickson stages um, of psychosocial development, infants or that age group between one and um, one month to like uh, 12 months, they go through something called trust versus mistrust. So basically, this is when um, the babies need to be... Um, cared for very meticulously so when we hear the baby crying or they have things such as diaper changes um, if they need that if they need to be fed we need to respond to those um, signs immediately because we won't be able to develop trust with the baby so the more that we feed them the more that we change their diapers the more that we provide care to the babies the more we actually gain trust with the little infant so you could think of this as caregivers responding to the basic needs of the baby as what accumulates for the trust versus mistrust aspect and infants also need a routine so it's good that if they you know they wake up every day you know maybe you change them um you know you feed them every day around 12 they take a nap at two it's very good for infants to have a routine but we don't want to over spoil a baby so we want to you know give them their basic needs, right? Like touching, holding them, you know, diaper changes, feeding them at the right times, but not overindulging into them. Um, because don't forget, babies are still like, they can take advantage, right? And get used to treatment that you might not be able to provide every day. So there needs to be a balance between the caregiving aspect and how much you spoil the baby. Um, there's also cognitive developments in the infant. So at six months, they actually develop this idea that they're separate individuals. By six months, they could recognize themselves as separate from the people around them. Um, but they can't not do that before six months. Other things that occur is they have something called object permanence. So between four and seven months in the textbook or ATI says nine to 10 months, but go by with whatever your textbook says. Um, Object permanence is when um, an infant starts to um, be able to recognize things that exist, even if they aren't there. So, for example, peekaboo, when you do that with a baby and you cover your face and then go peekaboo, they still know that you're there. And they're able to um, develop this um, idea of object permanence between four and seven months. Another example could be you show the baby a block and then you hide it behind your hand. They're going to walk up to you if they can walk or in this case, right, um, they're still too young to walk, but maybe they're going to grab on to the hand that they saw the object go into because they recognize that the object is still there. Um, sensory motor. Um, okay, I see a hand raised. Yeah, I was wondering for object permanence, is it like almost they know where to go? 
like say they know where the bathroom is or like they know like where to find things like in the house or like knowing it's there like I was confused on like the object permanence It's more or less this idea that, like, for example, if I was holding in my hand a coin and I show it to the baby, like, look at this coin, and I put it in my hand, they're going to know that the coin was in that hand. And maybe they'll put their hand out to touch the hand that it's in because they are aware that the object didn't just disappear because they can no longer see it. Before this age, right, if you were to hide the coin in your hand, they'd have no idea. They would not know what's going on. But as um, they reach this six-month um, area, they're able to say, oh, like in their mind, oh, my God, the coin is still in their hand. So they might try to touch the hand that it's in because they know it's still there. Um, or like if you, you know, hide a toy and they crawl, right, they might crawl towards where you, you know, hid the toy from them, which might be behind you because they know it's still there. Does that make sense? Yeah. Then there's um, sensory motor, which is birth to two years. Basically, this is just when they start develop senses and progressive motor skills and meaning how they can touch the environment, how they interact with the environment and how they start to walk. Um, this is just a progressive thing, right? It happens gradually and different things happen at different ages. So um, we could typically define this as motor skill development as um, what we're talking about in terms of their progressive motor skills. And then there's also um, sensory um, and senses that happen. But um, basically for motor skills, we have gross motor and fine motor. So their gross motor skills is the ability to use um, large muscle groups. So this is for balancing and posture. This is like basically their ability to like roll over, set up, walk, right? Fine motor is more the hand to eye movement in an orderly and progressive manner. So fine motor skills develop like how you touch things as a baby, right? So when they grasp onto objects or they touch things with their fingertips, right? Or when babies take food, right? And they like crunch it in their hands. That's the fine motor skills that have to do with more or less their senses. Whereas gross motor skills are like the big movements, like walking and turning and things like that. Um, so um, basically, um, gross motor skills, just to go over more of them and what important ones, at least that I had from my notes with um, Dr. McCrink, is that at one month, um, they should be able to lift their head off of a surface. At five months, they should be able to roll from back to front and front to back. And they should be able to sit up with some support. So like maybe you're holding their armpits or something and the little baby is able to sit up on their own with your support still there. At eight months, they can sit up completely unsupported and get into that position by themselves. So we don't have to help them go into that sit-up position. They can do it all by themselves at eight months. Um, additionally, at seven to eight months, one of the really important fine motor skills that they develop is that um, things that are in front of them, they will start to try and grab them with their fingertips. Um, and we typically call that racking is where they pick up things with their fingers and um, yeah, that's basically just what racking is, is that they pick things up with their fingers and the ability to use their fingers is called a pincer grasp. Um, and they also tend to put things in their mouth. Um, going back to gross motor, at nine months, they start to crawl. At 10 months, they can pull themselves up and start to cruise. Now, what cruising means is, let's just say they have a nearby, like, um, I don't know, I guess something they could hold on to, right? They can grab onto a nearby object and try to stand up and try to move, right? They'll walk with holding on to something, but they cannot walk independently. At 12 months, they can walk holding somebody's hand or somebody's finger. But by 15 months of age, the infant must be able to walk independently. If not, there's a problem. There's a problem with the motor um the gross motor development, and that could mean that there's um, they have some sort of problem.
But it's really important to know what happens at all the months because she will ask questions regarding what happens. Um, what should you see for gross motor skills at one month? What should you see at five months? All of those things. Um, okay. The next thing is social and emotional development. So at seven to nine months, um, babies will experience something called stranger anxiety where they're just basically afraid of people that aren't like their parents because they don't know who they are. And um, also during your toddler years as a baby, they'll also experience stranger anxiety. So toddler is like one to three years of age, right? And infants of seven to nine, they all experience this stranger anxiety. But um, yeah, they'll basically just cry in the presence of strangers. Um, so it's important to know that, okay, from seven to nine months, they could have that. It'll kind of go away and then it'll appear again in their toddler years. Um, separation anxiety also occurs around that age group. And, um, it's basically when the parents leave, they just start to cry because they don't want to be separated from their parents. So this is a good example might be when you typically bring a kindergarten age child to, you know, pre-K, they don't want to leave their parents and that's separation anxiety. Um, other things that they um, experience is play. Play is really, really important. That's how children learn. They learn through play and touching things, right? So something that happens with infants is they go through something called solitary play, which is where basically they don't share with other infants and they don't play directly with other infants. They can play in the same area as other infants, but they're not going to play with other infants. Um, they also are really big on sensory motor simulation because babies learn through touch. So they like to touch things, anything that's fluffy, that makes like crunchy sounds that are colorful. Babies love those things. They love mirrors because now, like we said, as they become to six months, they even notice that they're their own person. So they like looking at themselves. Um, anything that's like stacking toys and balls, all of that's really good for infants. Another thing that infants should be doing is tummy time, which promotes neck muscles and prevents um, plagiocephaly, which is basically a flat head in the back. So it's really important that as babies are playing, we put them for tummy time, which is where we put them on their stomach for a bit. Additionally, there's um, a chart called um, Table 25.5, Appropriate Toys for Newborns and Infants. So I would definitely know the different types of toys or the different types of things they should be playing with as age appropriate. Um, so for example, newborn to one month, they love colors and an unbreakable mirror, right? Because if we give them a real mirror and that thing breaks, they're going to hurt themselves, okay? And they love colored toys. At one to four months... They also will still use an unbreakable mirror. Um, they like rattles and they even love singing um, and music and patterns that, and things that they could see in books or images. At four to seven months, now they're getting more developed, right? They love easy to hold toys, right? And toys that make noises, so things they could shake in their hands. Um, they like fabric books um, and they even like fluffy soft like stuffed animals and they even start to love bath toys because these are things that they could touch with their hands from eight to 12 months now they're getting older right this is where they're starting to walk more they're getting better at their ability to um grasp things so they like plastic cups bowls buckets large building blocks stacking toys balls, toys, things like that. They like things that now um, they can either put together, they could touch with their hands, they can move or pick up, things like that. And they even love push-pull toys. So like those little, you know, vacuums or things that they could push around. That is also very good for that age group because they're starting to walk in things. Another thing that we have to do for this age group is also promote safety, right? So especially car seat safety. So infants' car seats should be facing the rear, um, middle, and not near any airbags of the car. The car seat should be secured tightly in the center back seat. So they should be in the middle, but facing the rear, okay? And not near any airbags and never leave an infant unattended in a car. The um, ATI and other things really like to ask about um, car safety for infants, especially the difference between an infant and an older child. So definitely know about your car safety. 
Um, home safety is also right. You need to child proof the home for an infant, especially by four months when, right, when they hit that five month mark and they can start rolling around and sit up, um, you know, with some support, they like to start touching things, right? Because babies learn by touch. So there needs to be no active cords on the floor. Um, cabinets need to be locked and no drop down crib rails because they can start playing with those and accidentally drop it and fall out of their crib. We have to be really careful with small toys because they can choke on them. So we need to have big toys. Um, there also is um, SIDS, which is, um, I, I, I can't think of the exact, I think it's, oh yeah, it's sudden infant death syndrome. There it is. It just clicked to me. So sudden infant death syndrome is caused when um, typically, let's just say a parent wants to sleep in the same bed with the baby. That's what can cause it. You do not sleep in the same bed with an infant. Infant should be sleeping on their back, right? On a firm mattress with nothing in the crib too. No blankets, no bumpers, nothing because that can all cause them to have like aspiration. They could choke on things. They could just stop breathing from something going on their face and they can't move it. So nothing in the cribs, no sleeping next to the babies, nothing like that. Another thing is water safety. Children and infants especially are very, um, easily able to drown. So never leave an infant unattended in the sink or the bathtub, right? Or any sort of pool or any body of water alone. Um, and the bathroom door should always be kept closed and have um, a toilet lid down because infants, like I said, they and especially younger children, drowning is one of the leading causes of death for kids. So you have to be very careful with water safety. They, they, those bathrooms especially need to be locked. Another thing is nutrition. Um, really important is breastfeeding actually helps decrease the incidence of sudden infant death syndrome. Um, however, breast milk is iron poor, so they need to have iron supplements um, after their four months of age. Um, infants should be regularly taking iron supplements to help with um, them not getting it from the breast milk. Um, formula could even come with iron. Um, so just be mindful of that. Um, you know, you don't want to over give iron to a child. Um, once again, we need to feed on Q, not on a regular schedule, but they should be fed when the baby wants to be fed. Um, that's when we feed them, not just when we feel like feeding them because babies know when they need to eat and they cannot, a really important teaching point, no cow's milk for the first year of life, only breast milk or formula. So the first year, no cow's milk. And no water under six months of age. And that's because they cannot swallow properly and they can start choking on it. From um, six months in age and older, they can have water. They can start to have juices, but no more than four to six ounces per day because we don't want to have um, them have really, really high sugar levels. Um, that's not good. And we need to make sure they have um, good uh, glycemic control. Um, solid foods as well. Um, can be introduced by six months of age. And once again, it's because they also have this um, thing called an extrusion, extrusion reflex, which is basically when if you try to put any sort of solid thing into their mouth, they start to push it out. But that's gone by six months age. So they almost try to push out anything that goes into their mouth. But now that they've reached six months of age, they don't do that anymore. So you want to introduce food very meticulously only one food item at a time every three to five days so for example if you're going to want them to try something like an orange right you give it one time you know every three to five days gradually introduce things to infants but the first food that should be introduced and you must know this the first food you're going to introduce at six months of age is going to be iron fortified cereal know that um other things, right, is that fruits and vegetables can be introduced between six and eight months. Meats are not going to be introduced until 10 months of age. Um, you could also advance to a double-handed cup with like a snap lid on it. So something they could start sucking and drinking from by six months of age. Um, finger foods, know this. By eight months, they have the pincer grass, so they could start having finger foods at eight months. And in terms of preventing allergies, um, there should be no um, no peanuts until six months and uh, make sure to do skin pricks as well as other foods to avoid. Um, it's in 
box actually 25.3 in your textbook. Um, but uh, things include honey, no egg yolks or meats until 10 months, no excessive amounts of fruit juice, no popcorn or small foods. Because remember, we said small objects can cause choking. Grapes and hot dog slices must be cut into smaller pieces. They could choke on it. Um, foods that are going to result in allergies include strawberries, citrus, wheat, cow's milk, eggs, whites, all of that they cannot have in infancy. But definitely know that iron fortified cereal and when they could start introducing foods like the munch. She asked a lot about that. The next chapter is chapter 26, which is the growth and development of toddler, which is one to three years of age. So basically, um, for physical growth, that anterior fontanelle closes by 18 months of age. Okay, know that. Know when the posterior and anterior fontanelle close, right? The toddler should also weigh four times the birth weight by three years of age. So going back to that example, right? If they were five pounds at birth, they should be 20 pounds by three years of age. They should be half an adult height at two years of age. Very important. Another thing is that psychosocially, they go through, um, if they're always, she's always going to go by Erickson stages. So you need to know the Erickson stage for each age group. But for toddlers, the next Erickson stage is autonomy versus shame and doubt. This is between ages one to three years old. Basically, the idea is that they want to do things on their own. And I've mentioned this before, that toddlers really need choices. Choices are very important to toddlers, and they must be able to have them. So an example might be giving them a choice of... Um, band-aids right um or asking them like oh which color do you like things like that are really important they want to feel like they have control toddlers like saying no um and yeah so other things include that they also struggle to self-master things they want to be able to do things on their own and do it perfectly we already said that they love no and a really important thing also for toddlers is they love rituals or what we call ritualism, they love doing things in the same order. That's why it's also important that if they have a routine at home, which is maybe watching, I don't know, Cocoa Melon right before they go to bed or an hour before they go to bed, and um, they also sleep with a specific, like a specific blanket or whatever, they should be doing those routines as well in the hospital because that can cause anxiety for um, the children. There's also emotional and psychosocial development, which is basically where um, babies, or specifically toddlers, are ecocentric. They're all about themselves. They also have very aggressive behaviors, and they, once again, they have separation anxiety. We said separation anxiety we see from seven to nine months, and we see it again in toddlers. So, um, we have to remember those things, that separation anxiety comes back in this age group. And they also have animism which is basically when um we have um they believe that inanimate objects have life so they might believe that their stuffed animal can talk and things like that um and they start to experience fears um you could see a little bit more in uh table 26.1 for erickson stages but i would know all of these um okay so um, the next thing is motor development specifically for um, the toddlers. So um, gross development includes that they'll have perpetual um, motion and increase um, steady gait so they can walk more, they can move more. Um, they can walk alone, right? By 15 months, they must be able to walk alone. They can start beginning to run and they could even um, jump and kick a ball by two years of age. Um, for fine motor, um, the skills that they develop, remember that's like touching things with their hands at 12 to 15 months, they start feeding themselves finger food. Um, at 18 months, they can remove their shoes and their socks. And at 24 months, they are able to figure out if they're right or left handed. Um, okay. So, Another thing is you can go to table 26.2 to see the different um, 
age groups. The ones I pointed out were the ones that um, Dr. McCrink specifically focused on. Another thing that I wanted to point out is that at 36 months or at three years of age, they can undress themselves. That's something that they could do as a fine motor skill. Okay. They also have social increases. So in their social behavior, they're going to um, undergo something called parallel play, which is basically where um, multiple toys need to be present because they don't know how to share. So they'll be in the same space. Maybe they all want to play with cars, but toddlers are not going to want to share the same car that they have. So there needs to be a lot of toys. They also like to imitate and they imitate typically the parents' behaviors. And um, they start to imitate what seems normal for their um female versus male behavior. So what their mom might do, um, little girls might start to like um, mimic that by like cooking and cleaning, let's just say if that's what their mom does, or if they watch their dad always really be like busy as a male, like he might say, oh, my dad works on like construction or car. So he might mimic those behaviors as well. And typically, like we said, um, for this age group, since they start walking and running, they love things that they can move such as large balls, um, coloring books they start getting into because like we said at 24 months they can determine if they're right or left-handed and they like shopping carts anything that they can move um and things like that um next thing is toilet training that becomes so crucial for toddlers and and a lot is asked about this not only in dr mccrink's exams but also in um the ATI. So basically, um, toddlers, when they're, um, we need to determine if they're ready to be um, toilet trained. And it's actually funny because I, my little brother is like the hardest person to toilet train. <laughs> He's a little older, but we're still trying to teach him. That's why it's really important between ages of two and three years of age, they need to start learning how to be potty trained so that they can do it on their own. But so, Bow movements need to occur on a regular schedule for a toddler, right? We talked about toddlers need rituals and they need to have a routine, okay? Toddlers express their needs or urges to defecate or urinate, and they're going to do this through different ways. They might look into or grab their diaper. Um, They might squat. They might cross their legs. They might grimace or grunt. They might hide behind a door or the couch when defecating. Um, typically, something that my little brother would do is that he would actually hide behind things when he was going to the bathroom. So babies or toddlers have cues. Um, that's how we're going to start teaching them how to go to the bathroom is looking for those cues. And when they have that cue, to get them to the bathroom, right? But other things to... Um, think about is that the diaper, it may not always be wet. This indicates that if the diaper isn't wet, the baby's able to hold in the urine, right? So they could hold in enough to go to the bathroom. The toddler is willing to follow instructions, right? So if you tell them, okay, we're going to bring it to the toilet and I'm going to use the potty, right? They should want to follow those instructions. Um, toddlers should be able to walk well and alone and be able to pull down their own pants. That's why we do this typically between two to three years of age. Um, toddlers will usually follow their caregivers to the bathroom. And um, toddlers will also should want to climb on the potty chair or on the toilet. And other ways that we can assess for readiness or we could see this toddler is ready to learn how to use the bathroom is one, that they're able to pull off their clothes and get on and off the toilet, right? Obviously, if they can't themselves physically pull off um, their own pants, they're not going to be able to go to the bathroom, right? They need communication skills to tell us when um they need to go to the bathroom. So they say like, mom, I need to, or dad, I need to go potty, right? Um, They also need to show interest in using the bathroom. That's a big thing. They should want to want to go to the bathroom. If they keep saying, no, I don't want to learn, they're not going to be as easy to train to go to the bathroom. The child should also have a predictable bowel movement. We already talked about ritualism. And when the child has a bowel movement, they have a cue to let you know, right? Such as, like we said, squatting or pulling on the diaper or maybe hiding like in a corner or something. Um, and if they're stressed, they can go into regression, which is where they act in a younger developmental state. So maybe if they're really stressed out, they may pee or defecate or poop in their diaper. The next group we're going to talk about is the growth and development of preschoolers, which is from three to six years old. So basically, um, this age group has an increasing um, increase of independence. They want to master self-care 
and motor skills, and they also have um, greater social and emotional um, maturity. Is there any questions uh, while I continue? No, I'm good. Okay. So yeah, these are really independent now. These preschoolers are like really trying to show I could do things on my own. They want to master things. They want to have motor skills and they like to be more social and they're getting more mature, right? And they go through something what we call initiative versus guilt for Erickson stages. So basically this is where um, they start to experience a lot of things. They like to um, act out roles. They begin to plan activities and make up games. They want to please their parents. They like exploring new things. they enjoy sports and all this stuff um and yeah so there's a bunch of different things like i said there's a big thing of independence and learning how to do things on their own and wanting to try things so other things that are going on besides psychosocially is they have cognitive development so they have magical thinking um which is pretty much where um they start to kind of zone off into their own world um In addition, they have imaginary friends. This age group has, like, they believe that they have, like, you know, an invisible friend. They also have animism, just like the toddler age group. They bring inanimate objects to life. Um, and uh, they also are understanding of what's right and what's wrong. At this age group, they're able to understand that. Before that, no. But this preschool age of three to six, they can understand what's right and what's wrong. Um Okay. Other things um, that they go through, just like the other groups, is advancing gross and fine motor development. So we know gross is the larger movement and fine is more of like the touching things. So for this age group, right, they're agile while standing, walking, running, and jumping. They'll scribble freely. They can copy circles and squares. They can feed themselves without spilling food. And by five years of age, this um, age group, they can start writing letters and cut with scissors and even recognize letters of their name. So we see how the progression of their motor skills and gross motor skills are enhancing. Um, additionally, they have emotional and um of uh, social needs so we already talked about initiative versus guilt um that they really have like um they want to do things they really like making friends they start to cooperate and share more unlike the toddlers and infants right but just like toddlers they need choices they want to be independent they need to have that so that's why it's really important to give them choices Um, they need interactions with their friends their play is typically dramatic um, imaginative and creative Um, once again, I already said magical thinking is where they kind of go into their own world, but it also means that they believe that their results, um, their actions result in something, um, which basically means that let's just say if they did something bad, they're also going to believe that, um, they were the cause of it, or, um, they believe that they thought in their mind, oh, that door, I'm going to make it open and it opened. So they believe that they did it. Um, they also have associative play, which means they learn to play well with other children. Um, toys for this age group, think anything imaginative, anything that like brings you into a, a world of creativity for this age group. So costumes, superheroes, arts and crafts, they love all that stuff. Dress up, puppets, playing kitchen, pretend food, pretending roles, right? Like um, being like oh I'm a construction worker I'm a police officer they like those things they like puzzles and drawing and all that stuff um they also have fears and specifically they have fears of the dark fears of insects and even fears of monsters and they're usually unrelated to reality and they love band-aids so one of the choices that we can give them is band-aids because remember this age group needs to have choices the next group is um Chapter 28, which is growth and development of the school age child, which is from six to 12 years of age. So psychosocially, they go through something what we call industry versus inferiority. This is where they start recognizing um, their grades, their trophies and teams. They basically want to succeed in personal and social tasks. They really want to be involved outside in clubs and sports. They have more interaction with their peers. Um, support and encouragement is really important. And they really don't like failure. So repeated failures can discourage children. So this age group really wants to do well and succeed. They find relationship with peers and teachers to be important. And at this age group, six to 12, they like 
they preferred company of the same sex friends. So girls will tend to stick with girls and boys will tend to stick with boys. Um, they also have fear of ridicule by peers and teachers. They don't want to be made fun of. That's really important to them. They don't really want to be made fun of by anybody. And they start to begin to develop their self-esteem. Another thing that this age group goes through cognitively is concrete thought. So they can start, this is really important, they can start to analyze cause and effects and they can rank things. So they can classify things in order like, oh, my favorite movie is the SpongeBob SquarePants and then I like Dora the Explorer. They can rank things or my favorite color is red and then my favorite color is blue. They can do things and they can start to begin to understand analogies. The last age group is the growth and development of adolescents, which is 12 to 18 years of age. Psychosocially, they go through what we call identity versus role confusion or diffusion, which is basically where they're really focused on their body. They're really focused on self-esteem. They have a lot of mood changes. Um, and they're really just trying to figure out who they are, defining by, uh, like boundaries between their parents and authority figures. Um they really want peer acceptance, so peer pressure is a big thing that can happen here. Um, they also start to struggle with the idea of like separating from their parents, but they also want to. And they begin to really, really understand their roles as they get older in this age group, right? But they're really just figuring out themselves, and they also really have... Um, a peer group identity is something that's really important and they want to be recognized by their peers as someone and, and peer influence could be a good or bad thing in this case. And they also really go through gender identity. They start looking at their sexual orientation and how they feel about themselves in this age group. They also have moral development where they understand and acknowledge laws and rules, but challenging rules is something that they also do. They will challenge things that they deem to be no, they don't like this, so they, they tend to challenge authority in this group. Um, other things that they go through, right, is um, emotionally and socially is self-concept, how they feel about themselves, very important concept for this age group. Um, body image, another very important thing, they feel very self-conscious in how they look and what they wear. Information from peers is like the most important thing for this age group, how the others view you. Relationship with parents, Emotional liability, you know, think about like emotional, like, mom, why aren't you letting me out? Oh, you're not letting me do this. All of those things, right? Um, <laughs> they also have, um, uh, like I said, um, they're trying to figure out their sexual orientation, how they feel about dating, um, and they start having more complex thoughts, feelings, and behaviors. Um, and that's the end of this.